Um, <laughs> Welcome to How to Write Good, the writing podcast that is not about how to write. My name is Daniel Poppy, your host. You can find out more about me at danielpoppy.com. If you haven't already, please follow How to Write Good on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you would like to stay up to date with both How to Write Good and everything I am working on, please sign up for my email list. You can find that at my website as well. Again, that's danielpoppy.com. If you haven't heard as well, I also have a serialized novel that is out. The first chapter is out. I'm going to be putting out one chapter every single month at the very least. Some months are going to have more than one. The serialized novel is called One Last Toast for Ebenezer Fleet, and you can find it in podcast form. So if you have a smartphone, what you can do is you can go on that smartphone and you can grab that in podcast form. If you do listen to it on this feed and you really, and you will enjoy the story, I really appreciate it if you went over to iTunes for One Last Toast for Ebenezer Fleet and you gave it a review. Now, some of you may want to wait until the story gets into more chapters, but if you already enjoy it and you think uh, that you want to do that, that would be great, as well as if you haven't already, going over to iTunes and giving this a review as well. Um, Yeah, so today I have my first guest of 2019, and it is Evan Swanky, and we actually ended up recording this. I should probably tell you who that is if you don't know, if you haven't heard it before, him before on my podcast. He's a friend of mine. He hosts a podcast called Pod Wars, and every other episode, he and some other guys talk about Star Wars, and then the other episodes they talk about, it's essentially nerd culture. So if you like that stuff, you can check this out. If you do listen to his podcast, I'm just going to tell you that this is the exact same audio he put out a couple weeks ago. So you don't have to listen to this podcast if you already listened to it on his, because you've already heard the audio. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show today and I hope you enjoy the conversation because I I certainly did, that's for sure. So, I, I when I was younger, which is like when I started getting into music, which is like the early 2000s, it was like the end of the rebellious music era. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm talking about? <laughs> mm-hmm. And from around I even the 50s, maybe even before, but the 50s, you know, you had stuff like Elvis Presley. And through yeah. up he to, was rebellious for yeah the 50s. it was rebellious for the fifties, and then you have like stuff in the six like I don't know what what was in the sixties that was rebellious, but then in the seventies came the punk scene and stuff like that, and then the punk scene kind of extended in a way, and it had like successors in, in like Blink One Eighty Two and Green Day, which I wouldn't call punk, yeah, and then <laughs> at the early two thousands, um, the in the early two thousands you had the end of that feel like the rebellious music. In feel you know what i'm talking about yeah so i've been thinking about that uh, that and i just wanted to bon- bounce it off you and see if that's like from the music scene i feel like there's a missing there's something missing because there's no rebellious music scene anymore i just yeah i agree because you had you had people that were like innovate like you had elvis yeah. presley like like they told whenever he was on the ed sullivan show they told the camera guys like don't sh- only shoot him from like the belly button up. Did they really say that? They'd, yeah, because huh. they didn't want him to be so like sexual yeah. with his body. Let's yeah. be honest; he was moving his hips, right? Like, yeah. like that was edgy. Like how he was dancing and being like he was being edgy, honestly. Yeah, I know, I know. With what what he was doing, and then you have the '60s, like with Jimi Hendrix and all those yeah. guys. Oh, yeah, that's like, who was in the '60s. Then right? you have the '70s, like countless bands yeah and the 80s was like you know these you know, I, f- the I feel 80s. like hair bands were like that right yeah. hair bands were rebellious because they were breaking out of the thing and the 90s you had stuff like uh nirvana which is i think i think nirvana i think i kind of summed it up nirvana is dirty indie punk mm-hmm. now yes. now it's kind of like that or it's like dirty indie or something like but it's still rebellious you know and in the early 2000s we had like blink 182 and we had uh you even had you even extend if you extend it, you have like follow boy, you know. Yeah, I would consider. I that have to say, I I really do like Blink One Eighty Two though. Like I do too; they're really good. They, I think that they made po- like punk rock popular. Honestly, well, I think that I don't even know if they're punk <laughs> nowadays. Who's to say? But but Nirvana, yeah, unpopular opinion. I'm just not a huge fan, honestly. I think. 
with Nirvana, I think that they have there's certain things about them that I'm like, yeah, like it's good that you existed. Like mm-hmm. you because there's certain like there's certain artistic things that I'm like, all right, this artistic thing contributed. Mm. And I'm not the biggest fan of Nirvana. There's a few things that I like, but I think they I think they have a very unique sound. Yeah, I can admit that, like that they affected rock like, yeah. heavily. Like I can just because I don't like them doesn't mean I can't admit like their impact on like Dave Grohl. You yeah. know, he was the drummer. Yeah. And now he's the lead singer of Foo Fighters. Like his music alone has impacted. So that all started with with Nirvana. Yeah. And now you have Dave, like the Foo Fighters, which they're just like. I feel like the Foo Fighters are are like that are that mainstream rock. Yeah, like they're the mainstream guys that are trying to hang on to it, but they're still like on the edge of being pop. But I mean, it's good. <laughs> but I do you think the Foo Fighters is like does it does it does it convey rebellion? I don't think it does. I, I it, honestly I no. Yeah, but Nirvana I think did, and I think one of the reasons why Nirvana did it, the, the little the little itty bit of that I know about Nirvana yeah. is because like Kurt Cobain was bipolar. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, con- that contributed a lot to his music because he's, I think it's in a way nihilistic, you mm-hmm. know, I think Nirvana was in a bit cause he, they which, made songs that were just not gibberish lyrics, but it was just like here, whatever, which and is, which is honestly like, one of my big problems. Like, yeah, like I, it's, it's smart because the, the music really portrays how he felt. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. So like that's you why feel I think when that's... you listen to it, you feel that way in which I don't like feeling that way. Yeah. I, so I'm yeah. like, I don't like feeling dirty and like nasty and self-loathing, you know? Yeah. And like, <laughs> I think that there's a place for that because it's like in the human experience, you know? And so that's why I think it's something that's con- like contributed to art because he's like, Hey, my life sucks or yeah. At times my life sucks. But going back to my original question. So do you think there's no, okay, I'll, I'll just, restate it it doesn't seem like there's any rebellious music scene right now okay yeah i was that true do you think that's the case i was gonna get to this i really what like if i could title this podcast and we've just started yeah it would basically be like like cultural music or something like that like like how culture has defined music yeah and when you think about those guys back in the 50s 60s 70s you know before the 2000s is they were trying to break out of what was the norm because let's be honest, like America was a more wholesome country back then. Mm-hmm. And these guys are trying to break out of that. Yeah. Now here, you know, in 2019, America is in a very wholesome place to live. And I think the music reflects that, but not in a rebel way because there's really nothing to rebel against yeah. anymore, which is actually one of my hugest problems with like pop songs that are like trying to talk about like, Oh, people tell you you're not pretty. Well, you are like, or all these different, they're trying to speak on these weird life things and they're making a bigger deal about yeah. it than it really is. And when really there's plenty of people in the world that don't have these terrible, you know, racist or sexist yeah. views, but mm-hmm. you're really playing it off in your music, but really not a lot of people share those views. And obviously if they do, they're terrible human beings, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, like good, <laughs> normal human beings will share that view. Like, yeah, racism and all this is wrong, but the media plays it up. So, I, I'm sorry. I don't even know where I'm going. I, I went off my on my own thing. But basically, if I go back to rebelling, we've already rebelled as America. Like our standards are very, our morals are really loose already. And I think the music reflects that more than rebellion. I think okay. it reflects like, let's go out and party. Let's have fun. Let's live while we're young. Like that's what the music reflect is reflecting because that's just the generation is the millennials. Like that's how they view. Like millennials don't like they're already raised in a rebellious like but, i'm just gonna do what i want kind of thing so one th- <laughs> and i'm a millennial I wonder if that's so case, though, <laughs> i can like, say that i think it's the case that if you look at like traditional morals the united states has shifted from traditional morals definitely i think we'd both agree with that right yeah but i don't know if i'd say millennials have rebelled or they're in a rebellious state i think like i think that they're actually like less likely because rebellion is kind of like a form of risk you're saying okay here's the status quo right and i'm going to go against the status quo and there is a status quo right now Mm. Uh, and our status quo is shifted from traditional morals uh towards something that's more you could call it liber liber libertine i guess but it just doesn't seem like there's anything that's coming up that sh- that is rebelling against. Like there's things that I see that are rebelling against that, but there's no music scene. Like you, you know, you run into art- artists who like rebel against that, or they're going against that, or they're trying to present different ideas. But I don't see a scene, and there's always yeah. it always seems that there's been a scene um, 
for the longest time. And that's that's really what I'm saying because I, I'm what I'm trying to say is exactly what you're saying, but yeah. it's not coming out clear because what I'm saying is the cultures from yeah. those these two periods are different. You know. Okay. So I agree with that. All right. Because yeah, because millennials, I don't think they're I, they don't they're not big as a generation. I don't think they take as many risks yeah, as no, past I generations. Agree. And and like I think that data shows that like you look at it they're less likely um i think generation i don't know about generation z but i think with millennials is generation z after millennials? below yeah just okay. below so right now i think it's like people who are just graduating college i think is like generation z really wow yeah so and they're yeah so we're we're kind of close not too close anymore mm-hmm. but uh millennials like they don't take as many risks mm. and i think one of the reasons why or one of the reasons i've heard or something i put up is like They've been protected so much mm. that they are afraid of taking risks. So they're more risk averse, and um, but maybe that's also with the generation below us too. So like, so I don't I don't necessarily think this is a good thing. But one of the stats was that um, less younger people who like less like high school kids weren't being sexually promiscuous. And I'm I'm not mm. a fan of that, but at the same time, yeah. it like um, some people were like, oh, that's a good thing. But the reason why, ac- yeah, the reason why they weren't being sexually promiscuous or they weren't trying new things out is because they were so insulated, they were actually afraid of doing something that was different. Hmm. And I think that to make good art, you almost, you can't be afraid of doing something that's different. Hmm. Yeah. And that's, and that's really personally where like the whole idea of trying to make new different art. Yes. I don't even, okay. Honestly, I don't think it can be done. <laughs> like I can, think everything is just an idea of something else. You know? Can you explain like, okay, <laughs> explain that more, please. Yeah, I know. <laughs> just because there's been, because there's been so much good stuff that's been made. Like the best music I think was made in from the seventies to, yeah. to the two thousands, you know, like that's my, and I just think everything now is, is churning all that again and just combining every, uh, you know, some kind of electronic, yeah. some kind of U2, you know, vibe, some kind of R&B vibe and, and everyone think, or some kind of 80s vibe. Like, I just think the big thing right now is kind of cre- is creating an 80s vibe. Like, think of Bruno Mars. And yeah. I think of the 1978, two totally different bands, but they're trying to recreate an 80s, you know, an 80s vibe with newer stuff. So... Personally, I don't think there's a whole lot that is different. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think there's still good music coming out, honestly, but there's not a whole lot to say. Like to say your band is different, unique is is I don't think is is true anymore because there's already so much out there, and there's probably something similar. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, but it's also cool because these bands are able to get ideas from a wide range, mm-hmm. you know, and then we get these cool things like country songs with rap, rap breakdowns over them. <laughs> I, that is the, that is the pinnacle of Western culture. It's country, <laughs> yeah. It's country songs with rap, uh, the rap breakdown in the middle. And you're like, and you just listen to them and you're listening to the twang and they hit the rap. You're like, yes, yes this is amazing. I love it. So heavy, much. heavy sarcasm yeah, there it's, guys. It's awesome. Um, I'm the, I hate, I hate country. Actually, I like old country. Okay. I'm a, I'm a fan of like folk, like really old country. Mm -hmm. You go back. So you go back to Johnny Cash and everything before. Mm -hmm. uh, And then that's like really old. And it's not like, not like the country today whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to say I hate country. I like all, all music genres. I can appreciate some kind of band from any genre. I'm a fan. So going a little off of everything, but I'm, I'm more of a fan of songs if that makes sense. So there's, if there's a song and it's a country song and then somebody takes it and they redo it mm. and they redo it in a way that is more like a style that I like, I might actually like that song. Okay. Right. So somebody might yeah. write a good song, but they taint it with the country. I like think the anyone, I, um, sorry. No, I think anyone would agree with that. Like if, if someone made this song the way I like it, I would like it. <laughs> yeah. But it's the same song, you know, has the same notes and okay. Yeah. Stuff like that. Like, um, a friend, a friend of mine who was on the show, uh, who writes folk? He actually calls the new country butt country. Butt country. He calls it butt country. Dude, that's what I call like like the heavy rock stations. Like the yeah, I call that butt rock. Why do you call it butt rock? <sighs> just sounds like it's coming out of a <laughs> butt. Like, you know? Rah, rah, rah. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> it's it's not. Everyone has a butt. Yeah. Just like everyone could have a song that sounds like this. 
So, it's yeah, just so, not. Yeah. It's not clever at all. It's just verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, end. And it's like all I did was listen to some guy go ring, ding, dong, da, 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 da. Honestly, new Metallica music is like that. Just yeah. repetitive and that kind of throaty thing. Like I'm just over it, you know. Yeah, and I don't I, think it was a shining point in rock history, <laughs> honestly. Metallica was very no, cutting the edge. singing. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's like the crazy thing is it's still hanging around, and there's still a whole station. There's multiple stations on the Reddit radio dedicated to that, to that kind of music. Okay, okay, I, okay. So to a certain degree, the throaty singing is like a guilty pleasure. Because <laughs> you, you run into those things that are just really bad, and you think they're so stupid, and you wonder yeah. why anybody ever did them. Mm-hmm. But you're like, okay, like somebody did this, so I'm just gonna like enjoy the fact that it's so bad. Another guilty <laughs> pleasure, another guilty pleasure of mine. Another guilty pleasure is pop music, like certain pop. That's all like, right. Just like no, 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 like this crap they play on the radio, right? And some of it's really That's, good, right? That, yeah, some of it's it like is. wow, but I like the crap, like Kesha. Dude, okay, Kesha isn't generally very good, but at the same time, it's so bad that I enjoy it's, it. Okay, so you're saying it's like it's a bad that it's funny. Yeah, it's so thing. bad okay. that I'm like, yeah, I'm going to embrace this. Like, uh, you know the song? I don't remember what it is. It's like, hush, girl, shut your lips, do the humming calendar, and talk with your hips. It's so <laughs> such a stupid line. <laughs> and part I? of me thinks it's genius. Part of me thinks it's just completely ironic, and they're yeah. just writing it to be ironic. But part of me is like, maybe they're serious. Yeah, you know, honestly, I have this deep, deep belief that like, the smartest artists, like let's talk Kesha, Miley Cyrus, yeah. Lady Gaga, they play dumb, but they're so smart. Yeah, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I think they're smart humans, but they're playing dumb because they know that's what will will get yeah. plays. Speaking of Miley Cyrus, there was this dad. I was walking with my with my daughter. She wasn't walking because she's four months old, but she walks already. <laughs> yeah, so, trust me. <laughs> I was crossing the street, and this dad was in his minivan. He had "Party in the USA" blasting. I would blast with party his in the USA. Oh, totally! With his windows totally up, and I could hear it full, like full tilt, like walk crossing. And like I was, I respected that honestly. He, was, I would respect that too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Do you, don't do you think that? So you essentially think. Um, that w- the rebellious music stuff has been played out, so you can't really make something new in rock anymore. Does you do you actually think that? Mostly, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be like absolute, yeah. You know? But I'm gonna say mostly because we honestly, us in this generation now, we pretend we're rebelling against stuff, yeah. But we're not. Yeah. We're like, let's do a march for this. Let's do a rally for this, and it's like, dude, you're not changing anything. You yeah, know? like. I, I think that's true. I think that we do do that. Like our generation in general. I think that we want to be. I think that there's things in the past that people could have rebelled against that were good. And then there's things in the past that were like set up as standards that people could rebel against like we were talking about. So there's things that I would say that are bad. And then there's like other things that are like that I would agree with that may like that people used to believe more or people used to believe. Um, generally more across the culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that you're probably right. I think that the bad things are gone. The good things are gone. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they're not gone completely, but in the culture, generally they're gone. So, Mm -hmm. like, there's nothing left for people to say. Well, there there is stuff left. Like, whatever is here, we can rebel against, but people just think they're rebelling against those things in the past because they want to be a part of this minority, right? The funny Mm -hmm. thing about it, I was talking to my wife. I'm not going to say her name because (laughs) I don't say it on the podcast. (laughs) Respect. But uh, out of respect, yeah. I like her. Yeah, I've said my wife's name, so oops, too late. I don't do that. (laughs) So one thing I was thinking that's really, really funny is Green Day has minority, you know, the song Minority. Okay, no, I don't know. You don't really? But it's like it talks about I want to be in the minority. <laughs> and there's awesome. a, a line in the band, a line in the song called, okay, it says, I want to be in the minority, down with the moral majority. The funny thing about that song is essentially like um, the moral majority is Ronald Reagan's coalition, I believe, right? So Dude, their songs are so political. Like, they are, it's really so political, political. you never know it. But, it's like insane. Yeah, the funny thing is, so the moral majority was Ronald Reagan's coalition. So in the 80s, there was a lot of like a really big conservative push. The 90s, Bill Clinton came around. And the really funny thing about it is, is when did Green Day write that song? Like around the time that Bill Clinton's presidency was ending uh, and the more liberal like side of things kind of took over the culture. Right. Or had already taken over the culture. So Green Day was singing, I want to be in the minority. 
even though they were in the majority. <laughs> and but the thing about it was, is back then when they were making the song, everybody thought that there was like this majority of like the moral. They thought that was still the case, where like this coalition of people who were essentially like, oh, we're moral and we believe these things. We are the majority. We're we're going to push forward these policies, whether you agree with them or not. Mm. But I think by that time in the nineties. I think it har- had already switched. I think that, mm. um, like, Hollywood is super liberal, right? I think that, um, I think most, I don't know about most publishing houses, but oh, the arts are super liberal, right? Yeah. And the arts push a culture forward. Mm. And by that time, I think the arts had pushed culture really far to the left. So Green Day was actually, they were rebelling, rebelling, <laughs> right? But they were in the majority, <laughs> which I think is really ironic and funny. But at that Dang. time, people didn't think, think I, I really think this is the case. At that time, people didn't think they were, so they accepted this, accepted the song as being a good song because if you have a song that's like rebelling against something, it has substance to it. Yeah. But if you're making a song and there's nothing to rebel against, it's like, what are you doing? Like, this is a joke. So you think, okay, let's... Let's let's define this for Dan and for the audience. Sure. So you're saying a good any song in general should have like a rebel cause or you're no, saying a good punk song. You're saying a punk well, song. Punk should... song should definitely have a rebel cause. I think that okay. the basis of punk is rebelling against something. All right. Cool. I really do. I like that. Yeah. yeah. I would agree. I would agree with that. So if you're and I think that there's a I think that there's a value if there's a, like if there if the younger generation is rebelling against something in the older um, that the older generation generally stands for. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't agree with everything. Like, if people in Gen Z started being like, oh, we don't like this, I wouldn't agree with them. But at the same time, like, not having that music scene or whatever scene, you know, it's generally music because music is is easier to proliferate. Prolif- it's easy to spread. Yeah, yeah. Right? It is. Music is easier to spread, and you can do it in smaller chunks, and you can, you can like, get people to hear it. So, like... I don't know. I think that I think you it's weird not to have it, you know? Yeah. And I don't know if it's good or bad, but I kind of miss it. Yeah. Some we can come back to that in a little bit. But something you said that makes me think about today's culture is you said music is easy to spread. Yeah. And this is something I thought we want to talk about is do you feel like it's easier for bands to, to come out of the woodwork and like get big or harder for bands nowadays? So I think that. There's like two things and they're working against each other. <laughs> I because, agree. And I'm sure I don't this even is know what your two things thing. are, but I agree that there's stuff working against each other. All right, go. There's there's certain things. Okay, so first, the internet is amazing for art. I mm-hmm. think the internet is one of the best things that has ever happened to art and ideas in general because like because we wouldn't be having this podcast if the internet didn't exist. Because True. what like like I would have never thought, oh, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna broadcast something. You know, I would have yeah. never thought that. Because that'd be life. such a big endeavor to go on the radio yeah. or whatever. But like here we are. Just yeah. So us two peasants, you know. Yeah, us two peasants. <laughs> and I don't know why anybody's listening, but us two peasants. So we can broadcast yeah. our ideas, which mm-hmm. whether they deserve to be broadcasted or not, <laughs> that and also like art in general. So I have a book out. Check out my book. Yes, go check it out, guys, for real. He hasn't read it, so hey, I he's will, read about three chapters. I did, but he's I, gotten pretty far for him. So and I had kudos. a kid, okay? <laughs> kid as well. so, I had a kid in the middle of it. For my book, uh, the regular process for getting a book done is you get an agent, which may take a year. So you have to write the book first, but after you write the book, you get an agent, which may take a year if the, your book is good enough. Then you get a publisher your agent gets you a publisher this is the general way you get it and that takes another year maybe so maybe it'd be two years until you get a publisher and it could take another year until you the publisher gets your stuff out on shelves and it might only be six weeks when your book is on shelves Mm. so i think that the internet's amazing and all the technology we have is amazing Mm. because uh you you can just do whatever like you as an individual person can be like huh i want to write a book i want to make music i want to um, make artwork because you can make it digital. You can digitize your art. And I want to just put it out into the world and let people find it. Mm. The issue with that is that because it allows so many people to do it, you have tons and tons of people doing it, right? Yeah. And then it's hard to stand out. So you've got to figure out a way to stand out. So I think that I think it's great, but at the same time, it's like a struggle to get anywhere. And I think you have to be tenacious to actually do anything. So for music, I think it's awesome because instead of, instead of, uh, like you're instead of uh, having a record label, you just put your stuff out online. You can make your own record label. 
And I think that is a pretty neat thing. That's the thing where it works against each other because there's so much stuff out there. But it's like you think about these bands like 21 Pilots, yeah. P- Post Malone, or just two recent ones I can think of. They were just little P, P bands, which is mo- – okay, I just didn't say P bands. That's weird. Like a, a P, like – they were tiny. Green, yeah. They were tiny, <laughs> and they blew up. Like they, they were, Post yeah. Malone was just on SoundCloud. I don't even think he put music on anything else. And like his song "Congratulations" got discovered. Boom! Like number one song, like top, like top forties for months. Like, mm-hmm. and same with Twenty One Pilots. And so that's a cool thing is those things can get discovered. And I mean that's a cool thing because bands back in the day couldn't do that. They would have to find a manager. Find mm-hmm. a label, mm-hmm. find someone to front the money to spend yeah. tons of money on an album. Now, you can make a pretty decent album if you know what you're doing in your apartment. You yeah, know? yeah. Technology is amazing. I think it's awesome. Yeah, but back then, you had to go to the big studios, pay the big money. Like you had yeah. to get this, and it was a huge investment, and you were you were risking it all. You know, nowadays I think it's a very small risk to the reward factor. I, I agree. Yeah. So for any, for any type of art, honestly, I think that if you're doing regular art, if you're making paintings, it's harder. But at the same time, you can make your paintings and sell them online. I and disagree. I actually think painting is the one art form right now that is more profitable than any of the others. Can you explain? I have a painter friend. This is the only reason I know. Is here's the thing. You know, you. Know, you know how you have like a goal that like you want to write write books for ten years and see what yeah. happens. Oh, five years. Five, five years. years. I'm gonna say oh five years and let's see how five years pans out. So yeah. my buddy said like he's like if I could take a five year break or ten year break and work on paintings, he's like I'm pretty sure I could get big mm-hmm. like and make money because there's people that actually still buy paintings mm-hmm. and pay big money and all this stuff. People don't buy music or books unfortunately as as much anymore, yeah. and so. I yeah, don't know. It's, it's from, less reward for a book, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the fact that I live with this this awesome painter, his name's Matt. You should check him out um, on Instagram. He's got cool stuff. It's like Matt W. It's MWM Studios. Go check him out. But I learned from him that it's actually a pretty, like, profitable business. But you okay. have to put the work in behind, like, ahead of it. So, so yeah. what were you going to say? Well, <laughs> I think that people think of it in the incorrect way for first of all you have st- people like uh 21 pilots was it and, and then post malone yeah yeah and they got big so i think that for them I, maybe it's not the case for them but most people think that people just get big out of the blue and you don't know how much work people are doing behind the mm-hmm. scenes have you ever heard of the tipping point is that a book uh, there, it's a book i okay. think it, i think the whole book so there's a guy called malcolm gladwell and he talks about he has a book called the tipping point and, and essentially you can think of your work as like a bucket and the bucket fills and it keeps on filling as you do work. So it, it compounds okay. over time and eventually mm. it tips, right? And that's the point where everything starts just like snowballing. Dang, so you get that's kind of what I was saying about my pain, snowballing. Like painting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's snowballing. So that's one idea. Like you do all this work and you're like, oh, like I'm going to keep on working, keep on working, keep on going. That's why I set like a, hey, let's see where I am in five years, right? Yeah. Man. So if I put five years into this, And I actually am working on it because I think some people think, oh, I'm just going to do this as a hobby. I think you have to be like, no, I'm going to take this on as like a job in a way. This is going to be my my side job and I'm going to put time toward it every single week or every single day. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a lot, maybe like 15 minutes only. And then eventually that's going to compound and it's going to build up and maybe it won't be five years, but maybe it'll be 10 years and Mm -hmm. then it'll tip and then you'll be able to do that for the rest of your life, which I mean with music or like with me for writing, even if it took 10 years and suddenly it's like, wow, you're making enough money to live off of. I'd be like, awesome. I only had to spend (laughs) 10 years and the rest of my life I can do this. Right. Yeah, Yeah. But there's this other idea too. Have you heard of the 1000 true fans idea? No. Okay. You you like this. So you don't need the whole world to know about you to make it as someone creative. You okay. only need 1,000 people who love what you do. I'm a believer in that. I yeah. believe that. You only need 1,000 people who are all sold out for what you do and love what you do. Mm. So what you do is instead of trying to get the whole world to love you, you make your work and you try to get it out and you try to get it out to the people who are going to really love it. You connect mm. to those people and you nurture those, those relationships. And then what you do is you're like, wow, I have a thousand people. And this sounds pretty 
like focused on money, but I think anybody mm -hmm. who's creative, I think you should focus like this instead of trying to make the world love you. Try to get yeah. people like a small group because I think a cult following is almost more satisfying than oh, I agree. mass appeal. I agree. I would, I would actually rather have a cult following than mass appeal, but you get a thousand people and you just, you, you give them what they want instead of mm -hmm. what everybody else wants to be like, yeah, I do what I like. I do my work for these thousand people. I've always believed that. I just didn't know it was actually called something that, yeah, it's a thousand. <laughs> It's a thousand true fans. It's actually a thing. But what is that do, a book too, or is that just saying? It's I can't remember. I'll I'll put it in. I'll try to find out who did it, and I'll send you the link. But I'll Sweet. I'll put it in um, my show notes as well. Uh, so this podcast is going to be on Evans podcast pod wars it's also gonna be on mine but you probably yeah. already heard that mm -hmm. so if you if you are on my podcast you can check out his check out his pod wars and check out mine if you're on his mm -hmm. and mine is called how to write good there you go some plugs but <laughs> i don't know i think that's more satisfying so instead of focusing on millions of people you get a thousand people and if a thousand people pay you 50 bucks a year right you get fifty thousand dollars a year and you can live off of that and mm -hmm. it's really modest so do your work Get stuff people those people want and give it to them, and then they'll buy it because mm -hmm. they want that stuff, and you're creating stuff that they really love, and then you've got your fan base that you can work off of. So I think people think too big. I think people should think smaller when it comes to it. I'll be one of your thousand if you be one of my thousand. I will be. <laughs> I'll be one of your thousand. Get him. Get an album out. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I gotta do the work first. Get like an album you said. Out. Do the work at the album. Out. <laughs> I will buy your album. What I was thinking about though is I like having um, musicians on my show. Dude, okay, I have to seriously plug you and encourage you. Like, I really love your artist interviews. You you ask like really good questions, and you always get like like cool people to come mm -hmm. on. So go check out how to write good because once a month or every so he tries to have artists on, and those are I really enjoy those episodes. Yeah, so. I appreciate that. Also, I also really enjoy your new. Uh, novelized serial audiobook serialized thing. novel, yeah, <laughs> serialized auto audiobook. So if if you don't, if you're not a guy that has or or a girl that has time to read a big book, um, but you want to get a taste of like Dan's writing, you should definitely listen to his new serialized novel. It's called One Last Toast for Ebenezer Fleet. If you type that into any podcast <laughs> app, you'll find it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the one thing. But it's cool. Like he's doing, he's basically writing a book and doing an audiobook, but one chapter at a time. Mm -hmm. Kind of like I don't know, like like a TV series that yeah. like comes out once a week. So I thought that was cool and unique. So I just had to share that. So, but anyways, go on about your artist interviews. So what I was thinking about with artist interviews is I was going to um, make a, cause I wanted to appreciate the artists I had on. So I wanted to make a playlist of the artists I had on like musicians. Cause it's easier to make a playlist so that I'm listening to their stuff because sometimes they get lost in the fray. And I'm like, why don't I just like, if I have a lot of musicians on, I can toss them into a playlist on like whatever I'm using and I can listen to their music. Dude, I had this weird thing like literally two days ago. I listened to like my like one of my own songs on Spotify for the first time in yeah. like months or like like oh, it seemed like a year or something, but it, it wasn't a year. But like I listened to Hourglass for the first time in a while. Yeah. And I was like, dude. This is great. <laughs> you like your old music? Yeah. Isn't really? that satisfying? It is satisfying. Like when you can write a song and be really, really proud of it. Because you're always proud of a song you write. But when you have one that you're like really proud of, it's, it's special. Yeah. So. That happens to me too. So I'm writing my second book. Uh, so I'm writing a series. And the series is called In Memoriam. If you want to check out the first book, it's called The Ninth Hour. Mm -hmm. You can just look up Daniel Poppy on Amazon. You'll find it. Uh, but I'm writing the second book, and I have the first draft written, so I'm typing it all up. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of running into the same thing as you. Someday, yeah. like today, I was typing stuff up, and I'm just like, this is trash. <laughs> I was like, this is so bad. I can't believe yeah. I wrote this, and I don't know what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> but the other day, I was typing stuff up, and I'm like, wow. Like, I can't <laughs> believe I made that. That's so good. Yeah, Like, man. you run into stuff, you're like, whoa, whoa. I, yeah. I, I think... I think when you like for me, it's really, really satisfying because I'm my biggest critic, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I, I type this up. I'm like, wow, I'm really enjoying this. Wow. This really hits home. <laughs> this has the exact emotional effect that, that I wanted, wanted to have. And it's, it's really, really cool. So it's kind of like the same thing as you. It's like 100%. It's yeah. really satisfying to be like, yeah, I did a good job here. That's really cool. Yeah. But going back to what you're, what you're taught, we were talking about before, unless you have something to say about that. No, man, I'm, I'm enjoying this. So just keep going on. <laughs> okay. Going back to that, like, I don't know. I think that, I think it's, so, I think the art scene, all, all different types of 
creativity is just it's amazing what you can do right now and what's open to you because there's no more gatekeepers uh, mm, because yeah. there's no you don't have to get a record label you don't have to get you don't have to go to a record company i mean you don't have to get a publisher um you don't have to i don't know what the equivalent is in other areas honestly but you don't have to go through those gatekeepers you can just be like hey i'm out on my own and i'm going to do this thing and i'm going to put it out and like for me that's for me i um like that's why I chose self publishing because I'm like, well, mm-hmm. I'm gonna fall, I'm gonna stand or fall on my own merits, you know. Yeah. As opposed to just be like, oh, like I, I'm gonna stand or fall based on the choices of someone else. Yeah. And I, I think there's something really good about that. I think that I have one more thing to say, but no, I, I, like I think that um, with that, I, I don't know exactly what I was thinking, but I think there's something really raw about doing that um Mm -hmm. it's hard to it's hard to explain exactly but if you have someone who's making art like whatever type of art you have or whatever type of art you choose and it's just them and they're just putting it out into the world and nobody is censoring them because in a way if you go to a through a publisher the publisher is censoring the artist because the art Mm -hmm. publisher is saying hey we need to take this out we need to make it this way i was thinking about my book that i wrote um recently that that got published last year that I published last year I published it and I was thinking about how if I brought it to a publisher what that publisher would do with it and that publisher would probably be like okay we have to fix all these um these sharp edges or we have to do this or that Mm -hmm. and um I don't know if I've talked about my book on my podcast but I think I talked about it on your podcast yeah well my book is the first of a series now this is this isn't the serialized novel this is the actual uh book I wrote Mm mm-hmm and the, ninth hour. the goal of the series is to tell a story throughout the whole series, right? And to do that, uh, I don't write – I don't have it – it's not tightly wrapped up in each book. When you have a series that's coming up from a publisher, each book is generally tightly wrapped up. And there's a goal that's – there's like a thread connecting the series. Mm-hmm. But because I'm doing it by myself and I don't have to go uh, – to the whims of a publisher, I can be like, oh, I have all these threads that are in the series, but I'm not wrapping up until later. Or I can be like, I'm going to say this, and I'm not going to even say anything about that until five books later. And then people (laughs) are going to be... And I think that's so much... I think that's super cool. Yeah, it's creative freedom. Yeah, it's creative freedom to do that, and I'm not getting censured. And it's your voice. Like, you feel like it's your style. Yeah, it's my style, and I'm... And honestly, like, I think I'm really brutal with myself when it comes to writing. I'm just like, I suck. Like, when I run into stuff that I suck, like, I really, I'm really bad at, I've generally been like, wow, I'm really, really horrible. And it took a really <laughs> long time in my life to get to a point where I was just working on writing so much that I was like, huh, I'm, I'm actually pretty good. Um, yeah, and I'm not you're trying not to, horrible, dude. I I'm enjoy. Not, <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to be full of myself, but yeah, yeah. like, I used to be someone who's just like, yeah, all my stuff is awful. And I just wrote so much and I kept on looking at it from that perspective. And eventually I'm like, whoa, I'm not bad anymore. But, um, <laughs> see, I still feel like I'm a bad song, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. Like it, it, in that position, it doesn't mean I don't like the songs, right? But I, yeah. I, I'm a bad songwriter in the fact that I just can't keep like spitting out like so, stuff. <laughs> yeah. What I, which yeah. is why I like your podcast. Cause like you encourage writers that have that issue and you also try to give advice, you know? Yeah. What I would say about that is like, just put stuff out, Yeah. you know? And, I've been and it's hard, you know, more. cause it, I think a big thing about art in general, and I'm just gonna, I think especially in music, especially when you're performing is you're like really putting yourself out there and you're you really, are, and you're really yes. vulnerable. Yes. Like, like, <laughs> you know, I kind of judge like, you know, musicians that say they struggle with anxiety and anxiety can't talk. Um, but I think every artist struggles struggles with anxiety in some aspect. I'm not mm-hmm. going to say it's like crippling yeah. anxiety for me at all. But before you play a live show, you get a little nervous and you're like, oh, poop. Then you play like a song that you wrote that like you put a lot into and you feel that like you feel anxious, you know, because mm-hmm. like that's it's really it's really vulnerable to put out a new song and you and you want you like your your main feeling like no matter who you are, like you want people to like it, you know? Yeah. And. And it's like, even if you think it's the best song, you still feel insecure about, you know? Yeah. So I don't mean to demean people that actually have like severe anxiety, but I think people that like, oh, I have stage anxiety. It's like, yeah, everyone does. Like everyone's going to be a little afraid to to go get up there, you know? (laughs) And uh, like, I think that 
I haven't thought I hadn't thought about that with musicians because with musicians you like are up in front of people you mm. know and that's a different because I always think of musicians as being a little more gregarious and outgoing and I think they generally are they generally are, you are. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. not as outgoing as you <laughs> and I don't think I'm not I'm definitely not but I think they are but I never thought about that because you're not just going out in front of people mm. you, you have the chance that everybody's going to be like oh this is just sucky yeah yeah. but i mean i think you kind of have to go back to what what comedians do because comedians i think because that's another form of art i think comedians to actually get good at it you just have to get out in front of people yeah. and you have to screw up and figure out what yeah. works and i think maybe it's the same way th- with musicians mm-hmm. you just keep on putting yourself out there and you're like what works what is what do, what do people like yeah you know or what what do people i know like and maybe i can expand that audience yeah um, I had another thought and I can't remember what it was, <laughs> but yeah, with, with anxiety, like, I mean, I have, I have pretty bad anxiety. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. I, so um, I'm see, that's why I had to apologize. Cause like, I'm not no, trying to demean no, people. No, 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 actually, no. When it like, comes to performing, right. when it comes to performing, it's like, everyone's going to get nervous, you know? Yeah. No, I have pretty bad anxiety and I mm-hmm. had it. I've had pretty bad anxiety my whole entire life. And like, honestly, it's, it's not an excuse. Um, you should just put yourself out there anyways because it gets better. Like mm-hmm. you're always going to be ner- like if you're someone who has anxiety. Like if you have let's just say you have an anxiety disorder and you put yourself out there, well you're going to get nervous about the fact that you're putting yourself out there, but what mm-hmm. eventually happens is you realize that people don't care about it, you <laughs> as much as you actually care about yourself. <laughs> yeah, and and for one. me, I always worried because it took me so long to just be like I'm just going to put stuff out into the world and I'm just going to see what happens. Yeah. It took me until the past few years to be like, yeah, you know what? Man. I'm doing this. Um, it took me until the end of college to be like, hey, I want to do this. Yeah, man. I'm, because first I thought that writing was worthless. And then I eventually am like, no, this matters in the world. Like making art matters. Mm. And then I, I'm like, and then I was like, well, I'm really worried about showing people what I make, you mm. know? And I, keep, I kept on going through this process. Then I have a book out and I keep on putting more and more stuff out. Mm. And now I'm still nervous about stuff. Yeah, and course. I'll send like, I'll have a, I'll send a podcast episode out. And the other night, like, I think it was last night I was like talking to my wife and I'm just like, who would ever want to listen to me? <laughs> I'm like, I just sound stupid and I have stupid ideas. Yeah, so I was just, I was seriously yeah, last night I was thinking that <laughs> and you know, it gets better. It, it's not something that stays the same. You're just like, if you're really, really nervous, you're really, really worried. If you put something out there, you'll be like, well, that's out in the world. And yeah. what people usually think is the world's going to come crashing down on them. And what they find out is maybe some people will dislike it. But mm-hmm. even the people in my life that I thought would be like, what are you doing? You're really, really stupid. Haven't responded negatively. Wow. That's you awesome. You know, um, like my oldest brother was always really critical of what I did. Mm-hmm. And then dude's really nice about the stuff I'm doing. Yeah, and I always yeah. thought, yeah, he's going to be like, what are you doing? This is stupid. <laughs> but he didn't, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that maybe there's some people who tell you who are going to tell you you're an idiot but honestly like if you really like doing it if you really like if you if you really enjoy making something whatever it is and you find a lot of meaning in it and you think you can convey something meaningful through it why wouldn't you do it you know mm. yeah man so and i think that's a cool thing like cuz people that really do have like severe anxiety can can get over it through art you know yeah and even if it never like fully goes away. So yeah. like, that's what it sounds like for you. Like it's been a good, outlet, yeah, it's so. been awesome. It's made it better. Yeah, man. I think so. Like, I think you're great with people, dude. <laughs> I th- you're more outgoing than me. You are, you're more outgoing than me. It, it definitely helps to be that way when you're on a stage for sure. But yeah. it still doesn't mean you're not nervous. Like for, for playing a show, even if it's like all my friends there, like I have to warm up with a couple songs before yeah. I feel confident, you know? Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. I mean, I would definitely have to, do that as well i mean i don't play music but yeah <laughs> i don't know i mean it's a different form of art it's a different kind of like dynamic the cool thing is is that if people like your stuff they're right there yeah exactly so that that's what i've that's really what i found is i i kind of take pride in the fact that i'm not a very like big or good like online like mm-hmm. like recording guy but like i feel like i'm a good like my band and myself like we do a good job with good job with live shows. Like, I think you do. And I, I, I kind of pride myself. Like, I like that. Like, I feel like a lot of bands are totally opposite. They're really yeah. good on the CD. And then you see them live and you're like, you know, you're boring, whatever, <laughs> you know? So I really enjoy playing live. And I never thought I would be that kind of musician or maybe I'm just really, I'm just so not good on a CD that yeah. the shows just make it that much better. Well, <laughs> you know, you're not bad. 
Like Thanks, I man. remember, I told you, I like, I'm like, yeah, this song's this song's not bad, which means it's pretty good. You know? Yeah, yeah, not I bad remember that. It's pretty good, but mm-hmm. uh, I don't remember what I was gonna say. I don't know. I think that that's an aspect to it, like being able to play live shows. Yeah, and because it's a lost really art, good. man. I feel like it is. Really, I don't watch live shows because it's too loud and there's too many people. I ju- I think only like you know the big bands put yeah. on good live shows. I don't think. Okay, once again, don't want to be speaking absolutes, but like. There's there are great small time bands that do li- good live shows, but everyone everyone nowadays is a one man band and they just mix it on the computer. Which yeah. like kudos, you can make really good stuff on yeah. good stuff on the computer. But if someone likes your stuff, like hey, come play a show, you're like, ooh, can I uh, just click the space bar and sing to it? You know, because yeah, <laughs> it's, like Owl uh, <laughs> City, yeah, yeah, I get a thousand hugs, <laughs> ten thousand lightning bugs, dude. I love Owl City. Come on, back I'm gonna up. stand behind my computer. <laughs> yeah, but it's a sad, and not do anything. It's a sad truth. You're like, and and you have to look out for it when you even see yeah. a live band. You're like, how much of this is a real instrument? Yeah, and which is hard for non musicians to tell. But I I feel like I have a pretty good ear, and that's like what I respect is when I see yeah a real band playing a real show and it sounds good. Well, and I think that it's kind of sad that there's not as many people actually playing instruments because Mm -hmm. the uh, music is social art, art in general is social, but music and making music I think is a social thing. So it's kind of sad when it's just like, Hey, I'm here and I do my stuff (laughs) and I can write all the music and put it on a computer because it takes away that social aspect of Mm -hmm. the music. And I think that people, musicians, I think draw energy from their bandmates and they're like, Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then it creates a better show because they have this relationship with their bandmates. Well, Mm. art writing is different. Like we were talking about before how, um, you're like, like with your band and stuff like that. It's just like people don't want to stick to it and they don't want to make time for it and stuff like that. Yeah. Writing's different because it's always solitary. Mm-hmm. But I think you're losing something in music when you suddenly go from a whole band and they each have their instruments that they play to a dude who <laughs> has a computer. I do. There's like a, something yeah. that's When you missing. go from a, a band to a computer, like yeah. what the heck, you know? Yeah, I just... And I think that the music is made differently too. I think the music has a different sound. Like I, you would, I think you would say that the music has a different sound. Yeah. I mean, dude, yes. <laughs> and I don't know. I'm, there's probably going to be a point where we can mimic instruments. Exactly. Mm-hmm. We're probably going to get a point where that can happen. Mm-hmm. But even so, I think that the music you make is probably different when you actually have people playing the instruments. It's like, all right, we're going to have this. All right, you're going to do this. And mm-hmm. then you record that music or, Maybe it's not even the recording of the music because, you know, you could make music up. But mm. maybe you think about music differently when you have to play it. You know, yeah. this person actually has to be able to play this song yeah. to make this music. You can't just do it, make them do whatever you want. So either you have to simplify it yeah. or you have to do it yourself. Yeah, you have to <laughs> do, do it yourself. Like, like, you know, yeah. if you have a bass line that your bass player can't play, you're not going to be able to record with that. Yeah. So, but I don't know. I think it's... That goes back to the uh, technology thing, and that's yeah. that's part of the technology that I don't like. Yeah, yeah. You know? But for sure, writing is more of a like writing books or whatever. It's more of a you have to be self like self motivated. You you but really do with that. the band. It's like you got to have multiple guys motivated and have the time and yeah. And I think the guys in my band are totally motivated. Just it's time, you know. Like, yeah, we have other stuff. Tough. We yeah. have kids and. Like, you know, Parker's in the, you know, he's a Marine. So it's like, yeah. it's not, we love it, um, but uh, it's not always doable. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I don't know, I think that our culture pushes us to not make time for things like that. Mm, for because sure. I think there's, that people think that being super busy is a virtue. They're like, oh, I'm busy, therefore I'm productive. Yeah. And I think that, I think one of the reasons why we think we're so busy is because we have so much technology and we have so much entertainment that we're not really busy. We're just filling our lives with entertainment. Yeah. And it's like, it's a, that's a challenge. Like, gr- like growing up right now. You mm-hmm. know? Like, yeah. And I, I don't envy kids right now at all. Dude. No, I think the same thing. I feel really bad for them because I'm like, you know, you're going to play video games and I know they're extremely fun because video yeah. games are amazing. Like they're Nowadays, really cool. They are and amazing. They're really fun and they're pretty much lifelike they're, mm. It's like watching a movie essentially, but you're, you're in control, but you're not, you're not interacting with anybody else. <laughs> Because, like, if you think back, if we go all the way back to talking about Nirvana, Nirvana <laughs> yeah, started let's, in let's a garage. Let's wrap this up with the beginning. <laughs> Nirvana started in a garage. And what it was is is it's a three guys, right? There's three guys in Nirvana. And they're just like, hey, let's make music because we're bored. 
<laughs> That's pretty much what I see it as. They're like, oh, we're bored. Oh, what are we going to do? We're going to start a band. Yeah. So they started a band in their garage. Dude. And I, I just, I don't know. I just, I feel it's really sad because technology allows you to, you can watch Netflix all day. You could yeah. easily watch Netflix all day. You could easily play video games all day and it just mm-hmm. sucks your life away. Yeah. And uh, I think it takes your creativity away. Mm-hmm. Really. It's, um, yeah. So start going back to a downer and going back to Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. I wonder if that if we what how what are we at for time? <laughs> We're at like fifty minutes. Oh, so. Okay, so let's wrap it up. So let's yeah, bring yeah. this back to let's bring the talk of technology changes. Let's bring the talk of bands and everything else. Let's bring it back to um, the changes in music. Can we bring it back to that? Is that even possible, dude? I'm just gonna stand by what I said earlier. I don't think it's changed much. I think everyone's just honestly recreating what was big before combining it yeah. and creating some mega sound. Okay. They're just using the better technology to recreate what's been done just at a better, like, like a more enhanced and more competitive level. Okay. So how will we do this? I have one more thing I want to say. Okay. And then I'm going to let you respond to it and we'll end it with your response. How about that? <laughs> oh man. Okay. If, <laughs> if you have anything to respond to it. All right. So this is what I think. I think that, People have been doing things differently from past generations, every single generation, for the whole history of the entire world, right? If you look back, now there's certain, there's certain things that are central to the human experience, and mm-hmm. there's certain things that don't change. But you have, throughout history, if you look back, there's just different ideas, there's different cultures, there's different ways of doing things. And in some ways, certain cultures built off of past cultures or they built mm. off of their forefathers or whatever and they changed it and in other cases it changed drastically for whatever reason um, but i think that music has changed it even before the 50s i think it was changing because you have stuff like jazz mm. and i think jazz was in a way rebellious it was trying to break out of the mold it was trying to do something different mm-hmm. so you have jazz and you have stuff like um, you go through the 50s the 60s the 70s etc up to the present day and i think what happened is um, maybe what happened, I'm not saying this is what happened, but maybe what happened is people there with music, there is that social aspect. There is this aspect of music. And maybe it's the case that we've hit a point where, um, we don't have time to change anything. Or maybe it's the case that we don't have time to do reflection on ourselves or something like Mm. that. Right. And because of the fact that we don't actually have time to think about stuff in our lives, and I'm not saying everybody doesn't think about stuff in our lives, but maybe maybe we don't have time to think about stuff in our lives. We don't have time to just prioritize. We we don't have time to like slow down Mm -hmm. and um, enough. We don't have time to slow down enough. We don't have time to look at life. We don't have time to see what's valuable and meaningful and we don't have time to so if we don't have time to slow down and see what's valuable and meaningful when we create music we are just looking back to the past and pulling th- things from the past and creating something that is a rehash of what's gone by because i have one more thing to say and then i'll let you go all right because i think that with art you any type of art anything creative uh if you just look at what's superficial. You're not going to get anywhere with it. I think you kind of have to dig down deeper. Mm. And I think that you have to, it's kind of like what you were talking about the last time we talked. So it, we have a podcast episode and Evan was talking about how there's three types of musicians. There's the poet, uh, the, what's the other one? The artist, the artist and the wizard. So I'll, we'll end with the poet, the artist and the wizard for what I'm saying. So the poet is someone who can write really good lyrics. And the poet is the person who, is let's just say like it's more like indie emo type of the, that type of music and the poet's the person who has these this painful things they go through and they take it and he and can they, relate lyrically like people latch onto his lyrics yeah people latch onto the lyrics of the poet because the poet can take the experiences and synth like and and distill it out into these these great lyrics and then the artist is someone who can who finds the perfect music essentially and the wizard's the person who can buy, combine those together all right and I think that to be a artist. And I think that to be a poet, you have to be someone who is willing to like slow down enough and find those. Mm. What I, I talk about this a lot in the podcast. When you're looking at art, you are trying to find the essence of something. So you're trying to find the core of something. So you're not just trying to um, you're not just trying to explain something. You're trying to find the commonality between two people mm-hmm. and how they see that thing. Like you're trying to find the true, like the true thing beyond what 
you're just explaining so that somebody can latch onto it and they can see it and they can understand it. I think the artist and I think the poet can under- do that. And if you have both of those, you become the wizard. So you've done that in both cases. Mm. And I think that maybe we've lost that. And I've just talked a lot, but. I think that's a great way to end it, honestly. All right. I mean, that's, that is the music that will still be big 100 years from now is the people that can do that. And it may not be 100% original, but that's what's, what people will always, be re- will always be able to relate to is good lyrics and a good melodic like music. So thank you, Nellit, for the ending, man. This has been awesome, dude. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for having me on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess we'll both um, – do you do once a week? Yeah, yeah. I'm a little late this week, so but yes, once a week. All right. We'll both see you next week then. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to support me more, what I would ask you to do is that you go to iTunes and you leave a a five-star review. That is something that really, really helps me and helps push the podcast out to different people. And it's something that doesn't cost you much time at all. So if you would do that, I would really appreciate that. And I definitely appreciate everyone who listens to this podcast. If you ever listen to this podcast and you have questions or you have topics you would like me to cover, you can send those to me and I'll look them over and I'll, I'll see which ones I think I can cover in, intelligently. And if you just want to reach out for anything at all, you can do that as well. Uh, thanks for your time. My name is Daniel Poppy. And as always, this is How to Write Good. <laughs>